Um, I'd like to welcome everyone joining us today uh, for our first um, symposium event of the fall 2021 season. Um, our first event is called Promoting Mental Health and Resilience Among the Pharmacy Workforce. And we're really pleased to be with you today, um, both on behalf of the Center for Practice Excellence out of the University of Toronto, which Zubin Austin and I um, manage, as well as the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network, or OPEN. Um, we're really pleased to be bringing you this event today. Um, and I should also introduce myself first. My name is Annalise Mathers. As I mentioned, I work very closely with Zubin Austin here at the University of Toronto. Um, and thrilled, thrilled to have you all joining us today. Um, I think the first thing that is really in order is acknowledging that our event today is in recognition of the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation here in Toronto um, and across Canada. So this day is really aligned with the university's, the University of Toronto's 34 calls to action, which identify short and long-term commitments um, to six areas of focus. I'd also like to invite everyone, in addition to recognizing today, um, to acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that this land continues to be home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I invite each of you joining us today um, to consider a land acknowledgement to wherever you might be joining us from and consider ways to make reconciliation a part of your daily life. Um, before we get started, a few little housekeeping items. Uh, so the event will be audio and video recorded and the recording will be available after um, the presentation today. Um, we're going to start off with a presentation from Kyle Wilby followed by um, a chat interview style with uh, Zubin and Vibhuti, and then we'll wrap up with audience Q&A. So when doing that, I'm just going to ask everyone in the audience to just use the chat box to send messages to individuals and, to, and or to the group, um, and we'll get to those in the moderated question and answer period at the end of the event. Um, and very quickly, uh, just about us. So the Center for Practice Excellence as well as the Dan Faculty of Pharmacy is committed to really um, a three-pronged approach of research, uh, educational scholarship, and practice excellence, and serves to bring together practitioners, researchers, staff, students, and professionals um, from across Canada, but increasingly around the world. And then OPEN, which is our co-host for today, is a team of multidisciplinary researchers working together to evaluate the quality outcomes and value of medica med medication management services that pharmacists and other healthcare professionals provide. Um, so for those of you who are joining us, uh, this is not the first event we've hosted with OPEN, but really thrilled to bring you um, today, which is part one of our series, the second, of, the second event, which will um, be happening in October, in late October, will focus on the public health mandate of pharmacy and then our third symposium event, which will take place in November, will focus on primary care and pharmacist integration into that space. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Kyle um, Wilby. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen and Kyle, I will just give you um, access to throw up your slides. Um, perfect. And I'll just introduce you while you pull those up if that sounds good. Um, so Kyle is an associate professor at the College of Pharmacy at Dalhousie University. He has a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of Saskatchewan, a postgraduate PharmD from UBC, and a PhD in Health Professions Education from Maastricht University. He spent the last 10 years working abroad in Ghana, Qatar, and most recently New Zealand in academic and administrative positions. His research interests include systems level equity, diversity, and inclusion, LGBTQ to plus health, health and education, health professions education, and workforce resilience. So just before I pass it over to Kyle, we're going to hear um, a keynote address from him. And then we will also be having an open discussion with Kyle um, Zubin Austin of the University of Toronto and also the beauty Aria. So the beauty is a professor at St. John's University College um, of Pharmacy and Health Sciences and a clinical advisor to the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She works to integrate pharmacists into public health initiatives, particularly among high-risk, medically underserved areas in New York City, 
and advises on legislation pertinent to pharmacy practice and access to care. She's also a member of the Health Department's Institutional Review Board and serves as a global lead for equity workforce development for the International Pharmaceutical Federation. And very finally, um, Zubin Austin is a professor and the Murray Koffler Research Chair at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. His research focuses on the professional and personal development of the health workforce. In 2017, in recognition of the impact of his work, he was installed as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, one of the highest honors for health researchers in Canada. He's also the only University of Toronto professor to ever have received the President's Teaching Award and the President's Research Impact Award for the global significance of his work. He's also been named Professor of the Year by students on 20 separate occasions. So without further ado, we have a great event, great speakers for today. Kyle, I'll let you take it from here. <laughs> Thanks very much, Annalise. I still get uh, a little starstruck when Zubin's bio is read, but uh, happy to be presenting today with, with him, who's a, a former mentor and supervisor of mine, as well as with UT, a, a good friend and colleague from New York. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for having me today. It's nice to be back in Canada, although it's a bit rainy, very rainy, actually, in Halifax at the moment. Uh, but uh, I've circled back through a few countries and nice to be with you and um, rejoining the workforce here uh, on home soil. I do want to start with the land acknowledgement and personal disclosures. So I'm presenting today from Halifax at Dalhousie University. And Dalhousie University is located in the Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Uh, personally, I always like to, to give a bit of a disclosure about where I come from so you can learn a little bit more about me. Uh, I grew up in Saskatchewan. Uh, I do identify as a cisgendered white male, despite having Indigenous background. And so I think that that does shape my perspective in terms of resilience and motivation and grit, um, especially when we start talking about intersectionality and cultural issues. I do identify as someone who's sexually diverse. And with that, I think also comes, uh, as with beauty, I hope we'll um, uh, further elaborate on uh, a lot of interesting um, intricacies when we speak about this subject. So I look forward to sharing with you my experience today. And, and thanks again for, for joining me. I was putting together my slides over the past couple of weeks, and then I actually put this bit here from Dr. Eric uh, just in a few minutes ago. And the reason why is because this topic today is so relevant. Uh, unfortunately, I guess it's relevant. Um, but just last night I was on um, the news. My parents were visiting from Saskatchewan. Uh, and we were just going over the news. And this was my home screen, looking at Alberta healthcare providers face growing mental health toll as ICUs push to the breaking point, Edmonton ICU staff receiving harassing phone calls. We need to mobilize now, um, call for supports in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I know that the pandemic pressures are not just facing Alberta and Saskatchewan, but I think it really puts a meaningful touch on what we're going to talk about today, especially from a systems point of view, and what we can do as regulators, governments, employers, individuals, education organizations and practice organizations to help relieve the stress that we're all feeling. I also um, wanted to point out this tweet here, um, because I think it really does hit on what, again, what we're gonna talk about, where the solution is not more resilience or medication, and really we need that top-down approach and to look at things more holistically. Now, with that heaviness aside, I do wanna introduce you to someone very special to me, who's my cat, Ash, and it wouldn't be a presentation if I didn't bring him up. I know the beauty is probably behind the screen laughing because she sees him quite a bit in these presentations. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring him up is because I wanted to introduce this idea of resilience, which is formally, um, I guess, defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. And as I started into this area about two to three years ago from a research and education point of view, I soon realized it is a lot more complicated than just that. And there's a lot uh, more to resilience and different aspects of resilience and simply how well you recover. But when I think about resilience, I do think about Ash because I dragged this cat from New Zealand, Dunedin, New Zealand, through Auckland, Vancouver, who then had to fly to Winnipeg, Regina, and Saskatoon before going through Toronto to Halifax on his way out here. But as you can see, he was in Vancouver. The agent sent me a nice little picture here, and now he's quite happy at our new place in Halifax. So 
for me, he epitomizes a lot of resilience and something, something that I picture when I start to think about um, how we can start to conceptualize this area. And he's meowing from the other room right now. My parents are trying to keep him quiet. So if you hear anything, that's what's going on over there. My experience with education, resilience and education and research has been a bit of a journey. Uh, as Annalise said, I've, I've come across uh, a few different countries in the past 10 years um, for work related purposes. And I wanted to give you a sense of, of where I came from in this journey and what my experiences have been to date. So in Qatar, for example, uh, I was really focused on academic administration. I've been in academia now nine years and seven of those years have been in the administrative portfolio. And I got a, a very good perception of what organizational culture was, as well as how culture itself uh, influences organizations. Things like how messaging influences organizations and how messaging can influence anxiety and stress of a workforce and how we can start to develop programmatic responses to stressors. So a great example in Qatar is we had a blockade, um, a, a political, economic, and geographic blockade imposed on the country while I was there. And we needed to think really quickly about how we were going to help our international students that were coming from countries that the blockade was being imposed on, as well as meet the needs of our staff as they were the uncertainty with whether they would be able to stay in the country versus food and drug supplies, those types of things. The key area when I really decided, or the key time and place when I decided to take this on as a research program, as well as get more involved in it from an education perspective, was at the Prato Pharmacy Education Symposium in 2019, run by Monash. And this conference uh, occurred just after I moved to New Zealand and was in the academic dean position there. And it, I by chance, went to this workshop by Karen Whitfield, who I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And, and it opened up my eyes to this world of resilience and motivation and how you know, these power skills, some would call them soft skills, we like to call them power skills, um, are important for workforce development, especially in our students and as well as a CPD perspective from our staff, for our staff. I also met the key players here, two of them being Karen and Babuti, uh, as you'll, you'll hear from today. And this was the meeting that formed Grit Farm. And I have a slide coming up on that just to give you a sense of, of who we are in terms of that organization. And then finally, the last few years, I was in New Zealand and I was in New Zealand throughout the pandemic. And so before the pandemic, we had implemented educational programming, looking at those transitions for students in terms of going to experiential training, what sort of coaching, well-being programming do they need? And then in the uh, pandemic, my, my mind frame really shifted to system level change and in particular system readiness. New Zealand, we had the luxury of coming out of the pandemic very quickly. We had five weeks of lockdown where we were online, although we were at the start of our semester when everything happened, so we were continuing online. And then we went into this mix of hybrid, in-person, online as pandemic levels changed. And I remember explicitly uh, talking to the beauty one day because I was in the academic dean position and we were transitioning back online uh, as we just had a, a bit of a scare in Auckland last August. And thinking, okay, wow, my staff, like they're, you know, we're, they're not in touch with Zoom anymore, even though it's only been a few months and students are struggling with having updates to the online software that we need them to be working with. And the beauty just sat there. And all I, all I remember is these, this force coming out of the computer of Kyle in 24 hours, you need to shift your department online. What exactly do you need in order to do that? I still have a bit of palpitations from that, but um, from that conversation, it really um, sparked her and my interest in systems readiness and looking at this from an organizational perspective, things like strategic planning in order to make your system uh, ready for um, these big changes that we're seeing, whether it's a pandemic or maybe a climate disaster or something else. And so that's what we're gonna really talk about today. So I think that's where we're at in the pandemic and with this topic of mental health, um, resilience, and motivation. But beauty doesn't usually yell at me. That was maybe just a one-off. I mentioned GRIT, <laughs> and uh, GRIT is a global community of practice. So this is that organization that formed out of that Prato conference. It's led by Karen Whitfield from Queensland, Australia, and Zubin, the beauty, and I are all part and, of members, and I believe we're all part of the strategic um, committee uh, for this organization. 
We're a group of like-minded uh, researchers, practitioners, educators, regulators from across the world who get together to have an informal network uh, to look at research, education, and policy with respect to um, resilience, motivation, grit itself. We do CPD and we have had funding in order to do that. If you are interested in um, learning more about what we do, um, there is a publication out about us. And if you would like to get involved, again, the contact information is there. Uh, but it really has, I think, brought together uh, in this time of need, uh, people from around the world with different perspectives in order to help move research and education policy forward. All right, so when I was trying to think about um, the main messages I wanted to get across to you today um, and hearing from Annalise and Zubin in terms of the priorities of your group, uh, I thought that my experience um, as a editorial board member and as an editor looking at evidence and scholarly activity in this area might be somewhat interesting and useful. And this um, slide here is really trying to depict where we're at in terms of evidence and what we know um, and what we're currently researching as a profession in terms of resilience, mental health, um, grit and motivation. And since the pandemic started, really what we are seeing are lots of papers coming out that are our people stressed, our, our students stressed, our pharmacists stressed, our community pharmacists stressed, our hospital pharmacists stressed. My favorite is our pharmacy students in fourth year who own pets stressed. And what we're seeing is, yes, people are stressed. And I think we've really answered that question. And not downplaying that we need to look at different populations, but as a whole, uh, we have moved past that. We have a lot of information that we now know that, yes, people are stressed. And on the next slide, I will go over some factors as we've investigated why people are stressed. The other area that a lot of research has come out in are really, is really about coping interventions. So things like mindfulness, things like meditation, journaling, yoga, self-care, um, and putting that onus on the individual rather than say the system in order to cope with that stress. Because um, as we know here, people are indeed stressed. And these interventions are more of the, the ones that I'm seeing across RSAP or across current um, in pharmacy teaching and learning are more you know, we implemented a program, students or profession liked it, um, might have helped them, but we're not really seeing those long-term impacts from it. And the major gap though, what I see, um, especially after uh, looking at this research for quite some time, is really about how systems can support the workforce. So I have a slide coming up, but uh, currently we're really focusing on the person and we're not looking at the system as a whole and what we can do as leaders, educators, regulators, policymakers, employers, um, uh, managers in order to help the workforce and relieve the stress that's actually occurring. But let's take a look a little bit further and look at the research that shows why the workforce is stressed. And this isn't groundbreaking information from you, but it gives us a perspective of where we're at as a profession in terms of the scholarly activity. So we know from both before and after the pandemic that workload pressures are a major source of stress for pharmacists and pharmacy students. Things like hours and overtime, patients and prescription loads and technical versus cognitive tasks. One thing that's come out in the pandemic is more about the health and social pressure. So things like childcare and elder care, health related concerns for our workforce, as well as the disruption of hobbies and routines. This has, been, this has led to stress, and this will come into some of the planning and system solutions that Bibuti and I will, will discuss later. Now, interestingly though, what we're seeing more commonly and started with one of Zubin's papers um, back in, it was published actually early online in 2020, has just come out in our stuff in 2021, is that pharmacists and, and even pharmacy students aren't recognizing that it's the, you know, the, they're able to cope with their own lives and cope with, many of these pressures, but it's the stress and the pressure of the employment environment or the school environment that's driving them to have stress, driving them to be anxious and driving them to face um, more commonalities of burnout. And why that's important is because, again, going back to, if I can go back to this slide, a lot of the research is really focused on the individual and less on actually focusing on how we can um, shift to um, 
relieve the stress that's coming from the system or from our employment circumstances. And it's not just the employment, but also from above. And that's what this slide really is depicting is, as with many things I find in, in pharmacy education and pharmacy practice, we really have the onus on the individual. So the individual is stressed, Kyle is stressed, Kyle needs self-care, this intervention we know might work for Kyle with self-care, and so let's implement that for Kyle for self-care. I see the same thing in the cultural competency, equity, diversity, inclusion literature um, that, that I'm well familiar with is the individual, the onus is on the individual and not on the system to change. And I think it's time and I think we are recognizing that, that we do need to change that. And these quotes are timely because that's exactly what this is saying. Our, I think our workforce has woken up and realized that self-care isn't um, going to be the be all end all to help them through the stress they're feeling with the pandemic at this time. Uh, this quote here is from Twitter. It's from a Saskatchewan pharmacist. It says, no amount of journaling or yoga is going to relieve the stress of the system making decisions that ultimately affect our mental health. And this was a result of an email this individual received um, suggesting that they need to be resilient and offered some suggestions. That email probably came from a really good place and from someone who was trying to be helpful. But I think, as I said, we're now at a time where this needs to shift more into a systems-based approach. And this was a pharmacy academic, basically just saying that they're tired of receiving emails to be resilient. And then the next one is to ask them to duplicate content for online pivoting. So again, increased workload pressures, but placing that onus on the individual to be the one who's resilient. So I mentioned the system uh, a few times here as we've gone through, and I wanted to give you a visual of what that looks like to me. And this is based on uh, some review of especially the business literature. And I've added in a few different components that I think are relevant um, for us uh, and our profession and healthcare professionals as a whole. Really that system is this you know, intermingling of factors such as leadership, strategy, strategic planning becomes very important, policies and procedures, your organizational culture as a whole, use of technology, then I've added in the profession because pharmacy itself and most healthcare professionals, professions are regulated um, by government organizations as well as have advocacy bodies that can help to contribute to the system level change. And so when we think of the system, consider these aspects in mind. I'm sure there's others, but these are really the primary components that we think of when we think of actually identifying and inflicting system-wide change. And this schematic, I just wanted to show is that you have the individual and you have that individual is going to get stressed at some point um, but it depends what that stress where that stress is coming from currently we have and we know from the evidence showing that stress is coming from the system from employment conditions and from um, demands that are being placed on that individual um, by employers by by the profession as a whole and if we can come up with strategies to shrink this and decrease the stress that's coming from and the pressure that's coming from the system, then hopefully the individual will need less coping, decrease stress leading to better mental health outcomes. And these other factors, which is just your general stress levels, will then be what they can prioritize and help use their coping strategies in order to overcome. And so the whole, the whole point here is that we need to shift away from you know, helping that individual cope, although we do, that is good information to, to know and to have, but really focus our efforts on looking at what system level changes are needed. And I think that fits really well, especially that today is September 30th. And, and in my reflection today, um, I read the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action points again. And what I noticed is that those are all primarily system level changes that need to occur. And so there's some, there are good parallels between what we're learning about today, as well as related to our own profession and how we can address stress for our specific workforce. So what can we do? Well, we've got the profession, we have governments, we have employers, uh, we have individuals. And I think there's many commonalities that we can do if you're working, say, as a manager in a hospital pharmacy or a community pharmacy lead or someone who is representing a government uh, ministry. Uh, there are commonalities that, that we can take in order to help relieve this pressure. And so I've taken this slide from uh, the business literature looking at five characteristics of resilient organizations. Again, nothing should be of shock here, but really showing that resilient organizations 
uh, which then have resilient uh, workforces are prepared, which is gonna be, I think, one of the most important ones. And I've linked uh, our diagram of the system to show you which different components might, might work within each of these characteristics to be adaptable. So have that organizational culture or readiness that the workforce is ready to adjust and to adapt to change. If you go as a, the great easiest example is online learning versus not online learning. Or if you're working in a community pharmacy and now have new policies, procedures, and precautions where you need to shift to within 24 hours uh, in order to deliver your services. Trustworthiness, collaborative, and responsible. And this is published from Deloitte, but uh, these five characteristics then as an organization can help if we strive to embody these characteristics uh, with whatever organization you're, you're working for, um, I think can help to drive that system level change. And so how can we do that? Well, there are calls for immediate actions for organizations. And again, I think we can really borrow from the business literature for this. And it's a bit of a progression. So one of the calls to action here is to identify important services and reliance on third-party providers. So for an example, in a community pharmacy setting, what are your essential services? We are essential service providers. So what are those essential services? And which ones are reliant on third, third party providers? Is it drug wholesalers, couriers, supply chains? And really mapping that out to know each component of the puzzle. If, for instance, um, uh, an emergency happened and in 24 hours that service needed to somehow pivot. Don't get mad at me for using the word pivot, please. <laughs> Uh, number two is to quantify impact tolerance. So as an organization to really have an understanding of what is the, what is the, the lowest level or the highest amount of impact you can take in order to still maintain that service delivery. And I'm gonna shift this one to Vibuti um, at the end of this presentation because Vibuti's expertise is in emergency preparedness. And I think we'll be able to talk a little bit more about this then. Three is to monitor and test against worst case scenarios. And I, I don't think we do this well as organizations, especially in healthcare. I know we do have code drills when I used to work in hospital, but I think back to elementary school and having fire drills um, you know, every month or every few months so that people knew exactly what to do, where to go and, and what's going to happen. Now that we've been through something that's really shell shocked the system, Perhaps we need to, to implement some you know, drills uh, per se into whatever organizations that we are working, working with. It goes back to that the beauty yelling at me uh, across the computer screen of in 24 hours, Kyle, you need to shift and you need to, what do you need in order to make your system ready? I think we need more of that, more of those conversations and more of those practical applications within the areas that we are working. Number four, I feel has a really strong, um, uh, it's where the individual can actually get involved. So to map the needs to provide that important service. And when I was in an academic leadership position, um, just in, in New Zealand just recently, when we were going in and out of the pandemic, we had professors, we had staff, uh, we had everybody just document when, you know, they needed the, the services that they were providing, whether it was an online lecture, an in-person lecture, and what they needed. Same thing could be said for, say, community pharmacy. So if someone's, say, delivering an essential service, whether that's provision of a medication, or whether it may be a cognitive service um, that needs to be delivered to, to a patient, having them document things that they need in order to deliver that service, and then relaying that and creating open dialogue uh, with the leaders of that organization will help then planning, um, especially in this monitoring and testing against the worst case scenarios. The number five, which I think is honestly one of the most important ones at all is communicating resilient discussions across organizations. And um, so those tweets, for instance, that I, that I quoted, perhaps the organizations of those employees were doing things and actively advocating to change workload or hire staff or shift the way things are done, but it might just not be communicated to the workforce. And for anyone who's been in a leadership position, you, I'm sure you'll agree with me that messaging can change everything. Uh, in New Zealand, we decided to centralize messaging to staff after we noticed stress occurring from mixed messages from the university versus the government versus our other parts of the department. And that was a great way to keep people together and to keep communication focused and have a great understanding of, of um, everything that was happening in the space and what we were doing. And so coming back to simple communication can be very effective. 
In terms of research and education priorities moving forward, as those are more practical considerations, I did want to propose three areas where I think that we need to go. And people that are working in scholarly activity would like to work in scholarly activity in this area. There are different aspects that, that are of priority right now. One is that research that informs this type of system level change. And I give, and it doesn't have to be that extensive. It can be simple, simple interventions. And I give this picture because for four years, I lived in the Middle East where we didn't have covered parking. And within one day, these, and Zubin knows this because he visited us there, but within one day, these covered parking umbrellas came up and it changed my life for the remaining two years I lived in the Middle East. And that was system level change that reduced a lot of stress for me when I was leaving work and going into my car. And so we do need research that informs system level change, whether it's at a um, intervention level or a planning level. And I'll give you an example of, of a project that the beauty and I have completed. Research that makes theoretical contributions. So all of those interventions that we study in terms of mindfulness, in terms of coping strategies, uh, in terms of helping people become more resilient as a workforce, as an individual are all really good. But now is the time to link them back to theory. So perhaps having mindfulness or perhaps having reflective journaling might actually be making somebody more self-aware, which could relate back to emotional intelligence, which we know is a learned, could be a learned capacity that we could help um, implement programming within our workforce. And so leaving, not leaving it solely at the intervention, but really linking it back to theory and trying to understand how we can then relate that across a CPD program or across an undergraduate curriculum um, or across leadership planning as a whole. And then finally, longitudinal um, and impactful educational programs. I think right now, I've had many conversations with different programs across Canada, and we are at a place where we're trying different interventions. We don't entirely know what a resilience curriculum would look like for an undergraduate stream. I'm guilty of implementing you know, one-off events and seeing how those run before we you know, move into a more structured approach. Uh, but we are at the point where we do need that longitudinal and impactful um, program, especially with competencies from now for changing and, uh, and the recognition that these skills are very important. And that isn't just based for undergraduate training, but also in CPD and organization training as well. So I'm going to end just with giving you a brief um, overview of, of a, a type of system level change study that could be done. Uh, when we talk about this, we and I constantly, commonly get questions about, well, you're researching systems, but what does that mean? And people find it maybe a bit, um, think that it's high, higher level, but really we're just breaking things down in terms of these different components. And we completed a study where we wanted to look at the intersection between strategy and technology and how we were preparing our workforce in order to effectively, how we were actually strategizing to effectively use technology in our programs. And so we had two keen students from New Zealand um, who did a document analysis of strategic plans of uh, pharmacy education programs in Canada and the United States, where they went through and they extracted um, any goal or objective that was related to um, technology and strategic planning for technology outside of research, but for the education program as a whole. And what we found, maybe not surprising, but what we found was that most, and we look at these top three categories here, most of those goals and objectives were solely focused on the technology. So it was about acquiring the technology, introducing technology, and improving or expanding technology without any recognition of the human components that occur for that technology to be used. And a minimal 15% um, actually looked at what we call prepare, which if you go back to resilient organizations was one of those key characteristics. And those were things like investing in faculty training and development uh, for the use of technology and ensuring that your workforce was actually uh, ready to use whatever you were improving, expanding, acquiring, or introducing. We then looked at the nature of the goals and how they actually were written in terms of what they were trying to achieve and found that very few were actually human focused. So there was only about three to 4% there that were focused on faculty staff development. Everything else was focused on the good of the program, which was good, but we would have liked to see more of these strategic planning goals actually explicitly highlight the humans that are behind the use of that technology in a program. 
So again, I referred to this where um, we could use um, and capitalize on these five characteristics of resilient organizations, specific, specifically using our strategy to make sure our workforce is more prepared. And that could include KPIs, things like how many meetings should be conducted online when we're not in a pandemic environment so that everyone has memory of whatever technology you're using or has thing, have things updated on their computers that they're able to actually contribute in a meeting. How many learning events should be online? We've learned a lot from the pandemic. Uh, in New Zealand, we decided to maintain some learning events online in case, and they have most recently had to reshift again to go to online, but because students were using that software, fa faculty and staff were also using that software, it was a much smoother transition than that first time, or if we would have simply left that technology and not strategized um, implementing some of these events um, after what we learned from that first round of the pandemic. So I'm going to leave you with this, and hopefully this is a, a good set, setting the stage uh, for the beauty. Um, but I like to think about our workforce and system as this Venn diagram, and one that if we have an inflexible system, then this overlap is not going to change. But the more flexibility we can put with that system, the more human focused we can make it, and the more we can adapt those characteristics of resilient systems, things like preparedness, responsibility, communication, hopefully this will change, there'll be greater overlap, and that we can create better interventions that will result in less stress and better outcomes for our workforce as a whole. And a shout out that if you do want to get in touch, uh, I am now in Halifax uh, in the beautiful South End. So please give me a, a shout on Twitter or by email and we're, I'm happy to chat further. And so Annalise, I'm going to shift it back to you and stop sharing my screen. Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Kyle, um, for that presentation. I think this is so, so timely. Um, I think this is something that's on the top of everyone's mind. Um, but I really appreciate the systems approach and kind of looking at a lot of these cross-cutting issues that um, affect us in the pharmacy workforce, but obviously have implications much, much more broadly than that. Um, I have a few questions, but in the spirit of keeping your, your presentation content going, I am going to flip it over now to Zubin Austin and the beauty to carry on um, with a kind of an informal fireside chat. Um, and then we will open it up to audience Q and A. So if at any point you want to type in your questions into the chat box, I will get to those after this next portion of our event. Okay. Well, thank you, Annalise. And thank you, Kyle, for your presentation. And thank you, the beauty for joining us from uh, New York City today. Uh, as I reflect on your presentation, Kyle, let me start by maybe being a little bit provocative by saying, yeah, 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 it's all great to talk about the system, but if I am a pharmacist working hard in my pharmacy and I'm overwhelmed and I am stressed and I see no end in sight, what's the system gonna do for me? What you're talking about in terms of system change sounds like it's the sort of thing that's gonna take 10, 20 or 30 years and I need help now. What would you say? either the beauty or cow, what would you say to the pharmacist who says, I need help now. I can't wait for a system to change. I think, thanks Zubin, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be a discussion with you without some provocativity there. So <laughs> all good. Um, I, I'll start and then the beauty uh, will probably have uh, a nice answer to follow up with. I think that from what I've seen in this space and working in this space within the last two years as part of the system, that some of these changes are really small and some of these changes, the small changes can be very impactful. But the key point there is the communication between the individual pharmacist and leaders and the system in the system in general, keeping in mind that that individual pharmacist is part of the system. So if you go back to those recommendations of um, you know, creating a resilient organization, I think it was number four, that was about documentation of, of individual needs for service provision, especially in an essential you know, service capacity. And I think that encouraging staff and having, I'm gonna use a beauty term, facilitating open dialogue between staff and leadership, um, whether it's through staff meetings, whether it's through email chains, whether it's through anonymous tip, virtual tip boxes, uh, 
is an effective strategy because as long as the system or the leaders are actually looking at that and, and thinking about changes that could be implemented and could be made. Okay. The beauty, does that sound like a kind of bureaucratic response that Kyle has just given us? The, it, to me, it sounded a little bit like, be patient, let's talk, it'll all be fine in the end. So just, we need a little bit more time. What yeah. if I don't have time? I think that, so one of the things I'd like to dispel is this myth that somehow an individual is separate from the system or a leader is separate from an employee, right? In the sense that we, I'll use quotes for that. I think so when we see a system that's working, whatever you wanna define a system as, right? I see it more of as a beehive. And I think traditionally we've all sort of seen it more as like a clock, you know, it has gears and things just sort of work but they're not necessarily like it's for the good of everybody. While it's true, if one gear messes up, some others you know, will feel the impact. I think a beehive mentality is what I usually go for in like my workshops and some of the things that it works, that it, the work that I do with strategic planning and stuff with organizations, because I think that it's, it's uh, sort of foolish to think that I somehow as a, leader, as a leader or a decision maker am separate from the employees who will be sort of impacted by the decisions that I make. So I think Kyle's right in that some of these changes that we see as systems level don't actually have to be huge. The, the trust and communications at the core of what we're talking about, right? So when we say that the system has to, uh, you know, we need change at the system level, what we're really saying is that you need to respond to people. So when people bring up concerns, you just need to respond to that. People need to feel heard. They wanna be seen and that's sort of, um, not to get group therapy on everybody, but like, you know, that's sort of at the at the core of a lot of issues that we're facing today. It's that when we don't see things as a collective, when we don't understand that um, trauma and healing can be a collective thing, we actually don't trust people. So we, we actually, you know, sort of avoid conversation rather than actually coming together to have that conversation, recognizing that all of us in our own ways are impacted by it. So mm -hmm. In, in the world of you know, emergency preparedness, why we've been sort of beating this uh, systems readiness thing um, is that there's not, there's not a lot of distance between how individuals are and how we behave in an organization and what quickly becomes the cultural norm or the organizational norm, right? And so while it may be important for me to understand, look, I need these things right now, and I don't trust the system, um, or I can't wait for the system, it's because I don't trust it, right? At the mm. core, I don't think anybody's listening and responding. And I think what we're talking about is that the system has to be nimble enough to respond and adapt in real time so that we don't have to wait for all of that bureaucratic change. And okay. each individual within that system actually has agency to create incremental changes that then add to the norms and, and becomes part of the culture. So it doesn't have to be a revolution, so to speak, right? Even revolutions start, start out small, mm -hmm. but that's what we're talking about. So you raise actually an interesting um, question, not just in terms of what we're talking about today, the resilience of the pharmacy workforce, but a much broader and important social issue, and that is trust. I would suggest that if you ask most pharmacists who are just going about doing their jobs, living their lives, they don't see themselves as the system. They see themselves as a cog in a large machine, and the system are people like us attending this event, educators, uh, regulators, researchers. And I would suggest in my sort of just a very anecdotal way that in the same way that we're seeing an enormous disconnect between, uh, between the average public and trust that they have in politicians or leaders or in other ways, I suggest we have the same problem in pharmacy today, if not worse, that average pharmacists look at the leaders who they equate with the system and don't trust them to have their best intentions at heart. They look at people like me and say, well, it's all well and good. You sit in a nice office and you get to work from home and you don't actually have to do uh, the stuff that we do. They look at their bosses and say, you're making a lot of money while I'm the one that actually seems to be um, stuck doing all of the crap. All of those sorts of things. How do we actually start to address that gap, um, the credibility or the trust gap between leaders and the profession as a whole. Maybe start with you, Vibuti, and look forward to what seeing you say after that, Kyle. 
Sure. I, I think that, again, it goes back to you have to acknowledge there's a gap and not pretend like it doesn't exist. Right. So there's a lot of performative, you know, lip service, sort of uh, what I call performative activism, right, that we've seen that, oh, yeah, we're about the cause. We're going to we're here for you. There's a lot of things that are said during meetings and papers and statements. But when it comes down to it, like I said, people don't feel heard that you have right that what you said is that I don't believe you have my best interest at heart. And I think part of that is the reality of the situation. You know, when I go into a space and somebody says, you know, here's all the stress I'm feeling, B, how do I like start managing whatever? I'm not seeing patients every single day, right? I'm not met with a certain reality that my clients might be met, met with or my mm -hmm. friends might be met with. And I think it's important to recognize and acknowledge that because it is true that we get to sit in our offices and make decisions that then impact people who are on the front line, so to speak. Um, and we don't necessarily get input. Right. And I think a lot of decisions that are made are made in ways that actually do not promote shared decision making. For example, a lot of the things we talk about with communities, do we ask our communities what they're actually looking for? Or do we go in there pretending we know what's best and we impart or, you know, a, sort of become an authority that says, I know what's what's your best interest at heart, but we don't mm. ask questions. So yeah. I think at a very fundamental level, we have to acknowledge that there is a gap. It does exist because I do not face your reality in and out, right? Day in mm -hmm. and day out. And number two, I have to ask questions, which is why I loved, Kyle, what you were talking about when people were asked to document, right? Um, the reason I posed, Kyle, that question was because I said, you know, it was really funny when pre-pandemic, I had requested, for example, for um, we should have some more remote meetings, right? Because we in our setup in our university, we have people who are at practice sites and whatever it takes time to commute to come together to a meeting. And um, I would be more efficient if I could log into a meeting rather than having to spend two hours commuting each way from my practice site and then tell my students to just sort of be on their own. And you know, it was actually seen as, uh, uh, you know, not being loyal, right? It was seen as mm -hmm. like, you're some, you know, if you really cared and if you were committed to this, you would show up like a good steward and, you know, come to this thing. And then pandemic shows up and now everything is, you know, Zoom and we spend 20 minutes going, is this camera working, right? <laughs> and so I think that, you know, in the world, again, of, of resilience, of the community resilience that I'm from in the public health space, you know, if we had to set up an operation within 24 hours or 48 hours um, or seven hours, could we do it for eight and a half million New Yorkers, give or take a couple of hundred thousand people who are of the surrounding area? Surely, if we can give, we can do that, we can probably create better resilient systems within our microcosms of universities and departments, et cetera. So why not look at it that way? So I think the acknowledgement and the open communication where it's bilateral, not me telling you what to do, but actually asking questions and seeking input um, is going to be important as a start. Okay. Kyle, uh, you, one, one of your roles is being on uh, the editorial board of uh, very important pharmacy journals like Research and Social Administrative Pharmacy, RSAP. Are you seeing anything in the literature that talks about the trust gap between pharmacists and the people who lead them? Is this actually an area that we, do we have any data or is this simply anecdote or uh, you know, speculation in terms of whether the led are happy with those leading them? Uh, great question. So from my perspective, I think we see the reverse. I think we see the leaders <laughs> writing about how the workforce needs to change and be motivated, uh, right? And mm -hmm. I think that there is a great opportunity there to explore more from a, where does that disconnect occur? And as Vivudu said, what is that gap? Um, and how do we actually recognize that and then work towards, um, uh, I don't know if extinguishing the gap is, is feasible, but at least recognizing it and, and ensuring that we are aware of that gap as we're making decisions um, mm -hmm. and communicating with our, with our workforce. Okay. Um, so let, let me be perhaps be a little bit more provocative. And I see that uh, at our meeting today, we do have some very, uh, some leaders who have both uh, positional authority and, you know, certain roles who I'm sure that, uh, you know, many people in leadership would say, it's all well and good that you're saying we need to talk, we need to communicate, we need to ask. But when we do that, all we get is chaos. All we get, if we ask 10 people, we get 11 opinions. 
if we ask 11 people, we'll get things that are so outlandish, they simply couldn't be feasible or financially uh, viable. At the end of the day, pharmacy is a business. Community pharmacy is a business. Of course, we care for our people. Of course, we want them to be stable. That's part of running a good business. But what you're talking about is simply too idealistic. There's not time and to, 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 to have this kind of dialogue that you're advocating. And even when we do, all we get is noise, no signal. Are we doing something wrong? Or is that an accurate actual appraisal of what happens when we, when we try to have collaboration, when we try to have participation, when we try to have dialogue? The beauty. So I think it's true, some of it is wrong, some of it is being done the wrong way. Um, I don't think there's any surprise there. I think that um, there has to be sort of embracing humility at the core of that, right? That people may have disagreements and different opinions than you. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, what if it does have 11 opinions? Are those opinions valid, right? Like how we're judging the input that we're getting is subjective, but the input that we're getting, we have to be a little bit more objective to say, does this make sense? Are these concerns? And maybe you can't, you know, maybe you identify the problem and whatever solution is proposed may not be feasible. But now that you've identified a problem, you can have a discussion around what could be mm. actually feasible. I think a lot of it is that you're not even identifying problems because you think my lens tells me a certain thing, but what, it's also subject to a critical examination by others. And I have to be open to that. So yeah, it could be, you know, we have to do it like the right way. And we have to understand that disagreement doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's always conflict. Mm, very interesting point. Kyle, your thoughts on my statement. I think a lot of what I've seen and, and from my colleagues that are working on the ground, uh, a lot of the mistrust or a lot of the, the negative feelings really just stem from this belief that, okay, as you said, the organization is, um, the, the, leaders are, are doing their thing, but we're the ones running it. And all we're getting is you need to do self-care, you need to do self-care, you need to do self-care. And I, there just needs, they can be fixed in terms of um, bringing in more discussion and more transparency with that. So for example, we've got many, many, many examples of, okay, what are, what are you doing then as an organization? How can you communicate the steps you're taking um, in order to rectify uh, the fact that we're short, uh, workload is stretched? or whatever these issues are that the workforce is dealing with, communicating that back down to the workforce is a simple measure that, that can be uh, really powerful. And I don't think we're seeing that in a lot of our organizations. Um, and then on the, the second side of that, I think having, having more, as Vivi was talking about, like more open discussions in terms of, okay, what we've learned and how we come from that. So for example, here, uh, now that I, I'm back in Canada, um, when I were, we've just um, gone back from online teaching to in-person teaching. And we brought up at a staff meeting, well, what happens if your, your child is, you know, needs to isolate and then can you, you know, teach on Zoom and that kind of thing? Can we shift online if we need to? And those conversations haven't happened. And, and I think that as educational institutions, which is just beyond our own program, it's, it's having that mistrust is coming because we're not having these conversations. We're not speaking about it. We're not, we don't seem to be learning from our past experiences. Mm -hmm. And so making that gap smaller, that communication gap smaller, even though you might get 11 different opinions, there might be one in there that's really important and one that could actually shift the whole mentality of that workforce if you address it and properly communicate about it. I'd like to actually highlight something the beauty said a few moments ago, and that had to do with um, perceived loyalty tests and the idea that somehow if you question something, so for example, what do you mean you don't wanna to come to a meeting? Are you not loyal to the organization? Are you not a team player? Are you not committed? And how that kind of broader culture that says this is the right way of doing it might actually be shutting down certain kinds of, uh, of conversations is a really important thing to keep in mind. I'm mindful of the fact that uh, Vibuti is going to need to leave us in a few moments for uh, other commitments. But before you do, Vibuti, I'm going to ask you and Kyle to think about and, and answer the following question. It, what do you think would be the single best and most impactful thing an organizational leader could do, and just one, um, tomorrow, in order to enhance the mental health, well-being, and resilience of his or her workplace? Uh, 
I would say that the word town hall comes to mind to collect some information because I just don't think people know. I think that we get slapped on. I, but I'm, I'm a yoga teacher as well. And I will tell you something that this whole self-care and it, it's ad nauseum that people are hearing it. And it, it's not just up to individuals to, you know, I've seen certificate programs that are 18 hours in front of a computer or whatever the case may be. I think people just need to ask questions because your reality and what you face may not be the same as my reality and what I face. And actually issues of equity and diversity and, um, and anti-racism come into this question because the same rules don't can't just apply to people and avoidance of conversation actually doesn't allow for nuanced conversations to happen. And I think that that's really important to understand different perspectives. So um, I think collecting true information, not just from people who want to please you and be loyal and tell you what you want to mm -hmm. hear. I think real information is important. Yeah. So authentic engagement with the workforce would be the, the, the first most important step um, in order to, to sort of deal with many of the issues that we've talked about. Kyle, from your perspective, what do you think would be the single most impactful step or uh, tech tactic uh, an organizational leader in pharmacy should consider tomorrow? The word that, that came to mind uh, immediately uh, was transparency, which encompasses, I, I think, a few different actions. Um, I see, as I, as I talked about, I see we're at this tipping point where the workforce has awoke. <laughs> they've, they've woken up. They've realized that, yes, self-care got them through the first year, but self-care isn't going to get them through the next year. And I think that organizational leaders now need to catch up to that and think, okay, now and start to actually plan for and um, communicate what they're doing in order to, to fix things from a systems point of view. Good. Your beauty, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your thoughts and for contributing so significantly to, uh, the, to work in this area. We're looking forward to having you back another time to uh, focus a lot on some of the other interesting things you do, particularly around areas of emergency preparedness, as well as uh, your leadership in the area of, uh, of inclusion, equity, and diversity. So thank you so much for joining us today. And feel thank free to stay until me. the very last minute if you can, because we're going to be going thank on you. for another 15 or 20 minutes, but thank you. Kyle, let me just follow up then on something that you've said, which perhaps has a uh, somewhat ominous tone to it, and that notion that the workforce is awakening. Um, and certainly we see this at universities. From When I first started teaching, one of the great things about being a professor was how respectful and deferential everybody was to me simply because of my job title. Um, and we know that's not the case today. We, we see this in the general public. Like, well, I don't care that you're a doctor. I'm not going to get my COVID jab. You're trying to put microchips into me. We are seeing this kind of, uh, of an awakening, rightly or wrongly, that is potentially leading to a kind of chaos. If you were a large pharmacy employer, um, how concerned would you be? And what are some of the options that you have in order to uh, focus on important employment issues like recruitment, retention? Uh, motivation in the workplace? Um, I think that it's, it is a uh, real, it is real. We just saw a, an election campaign that had everything you just talked about embedded within it, um, as well as in what's happening outside our hospitals and on public health centers. People are expressing their, um, their opinions quite freely. Uh, I think that for me, it's about facilitating um, light, I don't know if it's going to come across right, but facilitating light bulb moments and system-wide education. So in terms of having a workforce that say wakes up and rebels against organizational leadership, I don't think we're there yet. But as you said, we need to make sure that we keep, um, uh, keep being able to maintain our priorities of recruitment, retention, and, and what we need to do in order to keep our essential services running. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for I, I don't it come it all comes down to the same the same component. So if we're looking at a workforce that is skeptical of what's happening specifically during a pandemic, then perhaps we need to focus on preparedness and choose one of those characteristics that really will um, resonate with with the workforce. So going back to the beauty's point about actually digging for data, 
for instance, um, a question that I have uh, now, I'm, I'm a workforce member, I'm not in a leadership position here, is, you know, like, what is the university, Dalhousie University doing to prepare for, you know, if there's another wave of the pandemic as we're currently, you know, teaching in person and ensuring that those strategies are communicated to me and to where the workforce, I think, are really important. Um, we see a lot of groupthink mentality occurring at meetings. We see a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. We see a lot of you know, gossip, hallway talk, that type of thing across our organizations. And whether or not, um, you know, I think mistrust will exist more frequently with a lack of communication and a lack of transparency from the organization as a whole. I also think that incorporating this into strategic objectives of the organization, things around employee engagement, uh, things around employee development, is what Beauty and I found we really didn't see any human factors when we looked at technology as an example. I think that bringing those into our strategic planning and our strategic priorities will be beneficial um, as we move out of the pandemic, hopefully, and, and into a new, new era. Yeah, and that, that issue of trust just keeps coming up as sort of central, not just to sort of system change, but also to day-to-day -day operations, day-to-day um, -day activities uh, as, as we go around there. From a sort of a, a research perspective, how do you actually study this? How do you actually get a handle on where we are in terms of the trust the workforce has in its leadership and in its organizational structures? Uh, I think that there's many, you know, a multi-pronged approach is necessary. Um, uh, think of my old boss and I used to have in-depth arguments about quantitative versus qualitative and, you know, which is the best methodology to choose from. In this type of situation, I don't think that any voice is a, um, I think every voice should be heard as an example. So um, we're moving in qualitative research into an era where we're dealing less with saturation. We're speaking about saturation less. We're speaking more about collective experiences, lived experiences. And I think at this stage, as an initial stage, those are the voices that we need to hear. Um, as we, you had mentioned, you know, you might have 11 people saying different things. That's interesting, right? There may be there's commonalities there beyond what's being said, but on, you know, underpinning that in terms of maybe it is a trust thing as an example. Mm -hmm. um, so if I was to, to look into this further, I might, I might start there. Um, someone else might, you know, if, if an organization was, was larger and, and was already faced with, with this issue to an extent, they may you know, decide to try to quantify it, get a better sense of, of where things are at in terms of um, organizational priorities. But I, I would say we really do need to understand those stories, understand what people are experiencing, and see if there are commonalities that, that could base future interventions. Um, okay, thank you. And thank you so much, not just for your presentation, Kyle, but for uh, cheerfully participating in this kind of a grilling um, in terms of uh, questions your work. I'm going to turn it back over to Annalise to just ask a few final questions before we wind up for today. But thanks for joining us and for, uh, for all of your work in this area. Back over to you, Annalise. Thanks, Zubin. Um, yeah, Kyle, I did have a question for you, probably less provocative than Zubin's questions. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much. Those are just the great hearing responses um, and kind of strategically thinking forward. Um, my question is focused on supporting kind of the emerging workforce um, from kind of a systems and organizational perspective. And it kind of ties into the trust piece Zubin was, um, Zubin, you and the beauty have been talking about, um, but really thinking about is, is it being done, but how we can integrate this into curriculum um, for emerging healthcare professional students, whether that's in pharmacy or other disciplines, I think it can go beyond the health sciences, but I think focusing conversations about systems change regarding mental health, regarding resiliency are important. I'm not sure if they're being done um, or what strategies are to kind of reach for that aim, but I'd be really curious your perspectives on that. Oh, that's a great question. And that's one, and with all of this that we're talking about today, I think it should be acknowledged that, you know, we are at the, we're just starting to understand more about it. Um, and we, we need action, but we are, we're, we're still are, are really at the, the basics of understanding exactly the depth of, of what's, what's occurring in the workforce. 
For curriculum, I 100% agree. We do need this and it's been recognized worldwide that these types of skills are, are needed within the curriculum. But currently what I've seen and what I've done is really inter intervene in terms of one-off events as strategically placed at um, points of transition. But I will kind of segue to what I do when I teach LGBTQ health, uh, which I've been has been a journey for me. And one I think that might actually be quite useful as a model for, for resilience. And Karen Whitfield and I are working on a curriculum for, for Queens on that hopefully will become a model in the future. And what we did there is instead of just like really focusing on um, the individual and okay, you need to be culturally competent and this is how you, you, you speak to LGBTQ patients, which I always laugh at because I'm LGBTQ and I, I don't know why someone would need to have training in, in order to know how to speak to me. Um, and focusing on it's, these are the disparities and here are the problems and maybe here's how to rectify it. It's really bringing it back to why does that problem exist and what sort of system-based approaches could a student do, for instance. And we had really great success in New Zealand where we taught students um, about, okay, you're, a, you're an owner of a pharmacy. How do you create your pharmacy more inclusive for LGBTQ patients, BIPOC patients, patients of, you know, coming from any different cultural population? They hadn't really thought about that before. Things like physical signage, things like um, uh, the way that the, the counter is laid out for patients with disabilities, that type of thing. And I think that we need a similar approach for this type of work. So maybe what Zubin's, you know, talking about and really trying to get at in terms of, you know, how, do, how does this happen? How does how do, how do individual pharmacists trust the system more? Maybe we put that into our curriculum and maybe we actually get them to think about system level change and try to action system level change and understand how those different components work while also learning about how to be resilient and cope under um, pressured circumstances when they reach the workforce. Yeah, I think it's such an important point. And I think even just with all of the transitions that have been happening, with the different waves of COVID, um, more so for us here in Canada, I think even student trust in, in organizations to um, provide and, and notify people about certain modalities of learning, I think that that's been a, been a big piece in ensuring that students are getting the learning that they want during this time. Um, but combating that with, I think, the common struggle of where do I fit self-care into all this? And I particularly like that part of the discussion about, I think, there's a very didactic piece of you should be carving out time for self-care as an individual by yourself. Here are a couple options you can choose from, but it, I think maybe shifting towards, and I'd be happy to get your thoughts on this too, shifting towards not just telling you this, these are the, some of the things you can be doing, but how do we actually car make sure that we're actively carving time out of our day and our employees' days um, to make sure that you're not just working 18 hours and still supposed to have some self time for self-care in there. Yeah, and I, I liken that to my my three months, four months I lived in Toronto back a long time ago where I, I did an industry internship as a student at Bayer and they had a driving range and a little you know place you could go if you needed some self-care time. I think, you know, why, why don't we have that, you know, in practice and education settings and the pandemic might be not the best example because, you know, the, what we're seeing in Alberta, Saskatchewan, everywhere people are, are stretched and, and it's, it's, you know, that might not be the answer for them. But I think moving forward, we do need to plan that out. Um, I've been in academic leadership for seven years and we don't always look at it through the lens of, okay, where is, you know, we need to put in an extra hour about peripheral vascular disease, but you know, where, where can we put in time that allows students to maybe have a self-care afternoon or reflective um, uh, you know, journey that they, that they need to, you know, some sort of activity that they need to go through that might actually better help them understand the content. Um, I don't have the answer for that. I do think that that should be part of our academic planning processes. And as we, we move through here, really looking at, um, that, that intersection between content and, and skill development and how can we place our students in better frames of mind to develop skills and learn content without, again, overburdening and facilitating those spaces, as you said, in terms of um, providing opportunities for, for self-care and even just self-growth as professionals. Yeah, thank you. I, I know my last thought on that is just, just a bit of normalization of self-care. And I think sometimes I like that example used with Bayer, um, because I think sometimes in corporate environments that provide, you know, social hour or a social committee or 
things like that, it can be seen as really frivolous um, and kind of looked down upon. I, I think that that perception does exist. Um, but I think there's different ways of getting at that of how can we support self-care, but also self-growth. Um, and I think one of the things that I've missed the most at, about working here at the faculty is just the one-on-one -on -one personal conversations, the hallway conversations that are actually, I think, a form of self-care and often contribute to some sort of growth or some sort of light bulb moment, like you said earlier. So, um, yeah, I just, I really think that that's critical. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And uh, I visited Facebook in, in Dublin and, you know, their model is maybe not again feasible for a uh, community pharmacy, but really embracing employee focus and employee first. And that, that does relate back to, to what Vibut and I were talking about in terms of strategic planning and really ensuring we're accounting for human factors and workforce development in those plans. And I think that the more we do that, the more we can do that. Um, again, we're in exceptional circumstances right now. Um, we'll hopefully make a better workforce in the future. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I think overall, thank you so much today for your presentation, Kyle. Thank you, Zubin, for those wonderful, provocative questions, as always. Um, and I thank you to the beauty as well, who is uh, signed off, but really grateful. I think this is, as I said at the beginning, incredibly relevant, incredibly timely, incredibly important topic. Um, I hope everyone listening online uh, has really enjoyed this discussion. Um, the recording will be posted and I can circulate that to you, Kyle. We had quite a few people reach out to us who weren't able to attend today, but I think we're really interesting or sorry, really interested in hearing this discussion um, and may or may not have some follow-up questions. So I'd also like to just thank you for putting your contact information up um, and the partnership that you and the beauty have, I think uh, might lead to some great more discussion and I think we would love to host you again at uh, the Center for Practice Excellence. Thank you, um, yeah, and just a little comment from Lisa in the in the chat box there for for thank you, thanking you. Um, so again, thank you to everyone online. Um, we will be hosting two more symposium events this fall, as I mentioned. Um, so stay tuned for more details on that. But until then, uh, thank you again, Kyle. Thank you, Zubin. Um, and wishing everyone a uh, healthy, safe transition into fall. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.